Hello and welcome to Ask Lovecraft After Dark, your bi-weekly, that's a useless phrase because that means either every other week or twice a week, your fortnightly uh, program uh, wherein uh, I, your host, Lehman Kessler, sit down either by myself or with a luminary in the field of strangeness. And we have quite the luminous figure here this evening. We have Ken Height, writer and game designer. Uh, Ken has worked on numerous projects that we're going to be discussing tonight. Uh, and he specializes uh, in science fiction and horror and even more horror. And we're going to sort of dig down deep. So welcome, Ken. Thanks. Uh, well, I'm happy to be here, Lehman. Happy to be dug, even dug deeply, frankly. I, well, I, you know, I, I didn't have to delve too deeply. You're not quite at Balrog no, depth no. yet. Because, as you can tell, I don't have wings. That's, I mean, or uh, what was it? Uh, 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 pajama uh, uh, shoes? What was it that Bakshif infamously sort of left on his uh, Balrog during the uh, Lord of the Rings film? I, I, I don't remember Bakshif's Balrog at all. I assume oh. that it was something awesome, though. Well, there you go. Uh, so, uh, Ken, uh, and I were just actually very close to one another. Uh, Ken, uh, came down to Ohio this week for Origins and, uh, uh caught, uh, some of that, uh, delightful Origins, uh, convalescence. So uh, mm -hmm. how are you holding up with that? Uh, so far, so good. You know, uh, we were taking it day by day, hour by hour, checking my <laughs> pulse, <laughs> not overexerting myself. Cause that's the killer. That's what gets you. Yes. You come indeed. back from Origins and then you think. I'm going to go right to work. No, that's not the way to do it. <laughs> that's the uh, the con bends, essentially. Exactly. Right. You have to sort of repressurize yourself, get used to it. No, I, I made corrections. on, Or actually, I didn't make corrections. I responded to a very thorough copy editor's corrections of hideous creatures. So that was my job today Ooh. was to do that. Okay. And how did that go? Uh, well because they were a very thorough copy editor. Oh, <laughs> no, that's that's always helpful. Yep. And uh, aside from one place where it was like, I gave the Lynn Carter date and I meant to give the Lynn Carter date, they were pretty much right. <laughs> well, uh, sadly, I was not able, despite our proximity, to get down to Columbus uh, yes, to I'd enjoy them, you. the delights of uh, Origins. But uh, Ken and I have uh, managed to spend some time together, uh, all of it in the year 2015. Uh, we were both, uh, at, at both times in Portland. Uh, right. We uh, first ran into each other at uh, the Cthulhu Con uh, in Portland. And then that was the spring. And then that October, uh, we uh, swung around each other's orbits again for the HB Lovecraft Film Festival. Yes, indeed. And then you stopped coming as though you'd noticed I kept showing up. <laughs> <laughs> or as if I my, my children uh, were starting to get, you know, sort of larger and, and more troublesome. All I don't understand why that would make you not flee to the coast. <laughs> Perhaps I'm misapprehending the whole dynamic here. I, you know, it's, it's it's just a question of what type of home you want to return to. Right. Yeah. If you're gonna if you're gonna flee, you really got to commit. I find. All right. Well, fair enough. <laughs> but uh, those uh, those kind of experiences were actually uh, incredibly powerful for me. Um, I I wrote up a sort of a, an after con report, which I will go share in the chat right now. But um, it was, I had been listening to uh, Ken's podcast, Ken and Robin talk about stuff, a delightful podcast for all you folks out there. And so I knew, I knew, I knew Ken's work. Uh, I want to say uh, I learned about them from Paul Tevis because uh, I used to listen to Paul Tevis's various uh, uh, podcasts back in the day. And he was always singing Ken's praises. So uh, when I stumbled upon Ken and Robin talk about stuff, I was like, oh, well, this is very much right up my alley. It's film. It that Ken from the thing, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's food and film and gaming and history all sort of uh, wrapped up. Um, and then when I got to go to this convention, I was like, oh, there's there's the people I've been I've been listening to for so long. Uh, if you know that that fun meme that goes around of what podcasting is like, and it's just sort of showing a young man sitting and smiling next to like a giant poster of, you know, women eating yogurt. <laughs> This was as if one of those giant yogurt eating women had come to life or was walking in front of me. And uh, there was one particularly special moment uh, where uh, I was just sort of lurking around in, in the lobby as someone who really didn't know what to do between shows. Uh, and uh, y'all just sort of uh, gestured at me and said, hey, Lovecraft, come to dinner. And that was a fantastic moment. And that very much, um, as I as I wrote up uh, uh, in this sort of after report, very much felt like a kind of a 
coming into my own sense of of professionalism, uh, collegiality uh, with the folks in the in the horror and genre world, uh, it was a very uh, it was a very special thing, and it, it gave me a lot of confidence to sort of pursue this. And you know, three years later, I'm still at this. Uh, so I really, uh, I mean, there were many temptations to kind of uh, take off Lovecraft's flesh mask and set it aside. So that was uh, that was a very important moment. And um, if I haven't thanked you in person, I'll thank you now because that really was uh, an incredibly important moment for me. Well, mostly Robin and I just didn't want you to die of malnutrition in 1937. I mean, we, <laughs> there's precedent. Yeah, we just didn't want we we could see that train coming again, and we're like, we gotta get this boy some food. No cans well, of expired beans and uh, packets of crackers for for our boy Lehman Lovecraft. <laughs> Well, and also, uh, food has definitely been a nice shared uh, uh, adventure. Well, we got to dine in various spots in Portland. Uh, got to have uh, certainly the earliest Bloody Mary I've had, and the uh, uh, porkiest Bloody Mary I think I had. Mm -hmm. I had with you. Yep. Well, that's uh, that's the way to do it. I mean, you get all of your whole breakfast there in one meal. It's it's really like the health drinks the kids like so much. Pre precisely. Yeah. You know, it's like Soylent, except you want to drink it on purpose. <laughs> very true. Uh, and of course, another very special uh, uh, time I got to spend was uh, in a hotel room with Ken watching the Turkish Dracula. That's right. That was that was at the legendary Banfield Inn in Portland, <laughs> which is slightly different from the Gilman House in the, the <laughs> Gilman House as a restaurant. So that's the important difference there. But uh, yeah, we were uh, hanging out. It was during the Lovecraft Film Festival. I was doing the emergency watch of all Draculas for my book, Thrill of Dracula, for the Pelgrane Press as part of the fulfillment for the Dracula dossier. And the my, my, uh, my one that had come up that time was the Turkish Dracula, um, uh, Dracula in Istanbul. Uh, and it was... Uh, you know, it's on YouTube, so I figured I'll just watch it in the hotel room and get it over with. And hey, here's Lehman. He's been idiot enough to be my friend. Let's see if he can take take the alpha level. And so it's like, <laughs> hey, Lehman, come, come, come watch uh, Turkish Dracula with me. Let's see how smart you are after that. Oh. And we had a great time, of course, because it was a, a fantabulous experience. It was an interesting movie uh, for the, you know, given it was a garbage YouTube transfer was actually a pretty good movie all, all things considered right now how much how much dracula did you watch in how short a span of time i watched at least 40 draculas in under 30 days that's that's arguably too many draculas yes, it's, it's arguably too and i and there and there's a, a whole section in the front of the book where i list all the ones i didn't get to that i, I missed like i just now got and haven't watched yet the uh japanese dracula trilogy that toho did Lake of Dracula, uh, Blood Doll, and I forget what the other one's called, Eyes of Dracula or something like that. And uh, these are not technically about Dracula. They're about, like, the grandson of Dracula or something like that. But it's a vampire movie. It's by Toho Studios, and it's from the same era as the Hammer films. So they're basically trying to do uh, Hammer knockoffs. So I'm looking forward to maybe, you know, returning to a ru rundown hotel with a weird fiction impersonator. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know what? Us. Any any time our our yeah. paths cross and we need to you know get crank out some some Dracula, some uh, let's you know where to find me. Absolutely. Now, uh, uh, Dracula dossier is a incredibly uh, thorough and uh, some might and say uh, might argue uh, obsessive project. Uh, <laughs> I found it to be incredibly exciting. Uh, you know, Dracula is is one of those <clears throat> things that's sort of you know just taken for granted as a sort of a pop cultural what have you, but it takes a certain just genius slash madness to do what you did uh, going through Dra uh, Dracula. And I, I don't even know how to describe what you did to it. You you annotated it uh, to pull out the the sort of maximum paranoia. <laughs> is, that, yeah. is that fair? I mean, the notion is that, I mean, uh, subverting, inverting, uh, detorting, whatever you want to call it, Dracula goes at least back to Fred Saberhagen's the Dracula tape, which is a pretty adequate paperback novel about how Dracula is a misunderstood good guy and is uh, wrong, but still. So that it's not like I invented the idea of finding more in Dracula than is in Dracula. And then I'm sure Philip Jose Farmer's done a million things with it that I just didn't pay attention to. <laughs> but I got the notion 
because possibly because I just written the vampire spy thriller game Knights Black Agents. That what Dracula obviously is is the after action report of a failed attempt to recruit a vampire by British intelligence. Because look at it, right? I mean, <laughs> none of the story sort of makes overt sense. Dracula <laughs> shows up at exactly the same place that all the main characters happen to be, you know, having their summer vacation. He buys a house right next to the main character's uh, girlfriend's best friend's uh, failed suitor. I mean, there's so many ties that it's obvious that he was being brought in and provided a support network by somebody. And that somebody is Peter Hawkins, who conveniently dies in the middle of the novel. Uh, Van Helsing is supposedly Dutch, but he curses in German. There's a lot of stuff going on under the surface <laughs> of the Dracula. And well, I thought, why not make it a spy novel and then see what happens? And so what uh, I did with Gareth Hanrahan, who deserves all the credit, uh, except, of course, for the part that I steal from him, um, we took Dracula, we expanded it, we unredacted it, we restored the parts that were the um, uh, sources and methods, the, in, the indications that it was, in fact, a spy operation. And we then, as you say, annotated it to maximize and highlight all the paranoiac uh, elements such as the ones that I just listed. Well, and this is so. This is the year that I finally sort of sat down to start reading Dracula. And it, again, it's if you've if you've heard about Dracula, if you sort of you know, if you've seen the films, if you've seen one of the many 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 films, you again you sort of know Dracula. But until you actually read it, <laughs> you're like, what what on earth? Yeah, this, this sort of this bizarre stitching together of of journals and letters, and then journals based on them reading each other's journals <laughs> and yeah. like it's 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 already this strange and it feels like a ridiculous role-playing game from the get-go it's like yeah. all the players run off to do their own thing then they come back together and they're like all right this is what happened and like uh we failed these you know checks and this player what? wasn't there so we sort of didn't tell her anything that was happening and i think the gm may have done something while we weren't doing that but it, it, uh, it uh, what triggered that specifically for me, there's a part where they are standing around arguing about how to break into Dracula's house in Piccadilly. And they're having a player character discussion. Let's just bust in. The cops will see us. But what about this? What about this? And while they're having the argument, um, uh, Godalming calls the locksmith and has the locksmith come over and just change the keys. And he just uses his, you know, credit rating slash bluff skill <laughs> to convince him that he owns the house. And it's like, that's such a clear <laughs> role playing thing. And then they go in and then they're standing around not accomplishing anything. I think that they may have um, uh, 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 re-sanctified his, um, uh, his coffins in Piccadilly. And then Dracula comes home and there's a line, I swear to God, and I think it's from uh, supposedly from Harker's journal that's like, it probably would have been a good idea to have had a plan as to what to do if he comes back. And I'm like, this is a role-playing game campaign. And I mentioned that to, to Gareth, and he says, well, of course it is. Look at this. You know that GM said, we're playing a game of Victorian terror in which a vampire is loose in London. And one of the players says, I'm going to play a cowboy. And it's like, you can't play a cowboy. There's no cowboys in London. I'm playing a cowboy, and I've got a gun. And it's like, ah. Oh. I mean, well, he forgets to put any points in the gun, so he never hits anything in the whole book. <laughs> oh, that's so true. It's the, essentially the Ama Ninja. <laughs> yeah, but it's but uh, all that said, it's still an incredibly good novel. I mean, it's just a great horror novel, don't you think? Or were you of that ilk that uh, that uh, either from presentism or or whatever else just can't get into a good epistolary gothic? Uh, it just it 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 does keep sort of going and yeah. going and you're like all right let's i mean i think there's a bit of that sort of pacing and it didn't help that i started reading it right after my son was born so just my ability to like right read. <laughs> sleep deprived and insane and yeah which in theory should be the best time to read you right, know yeah, or epistolary yeah. um mm -hmm. so so yeah so that that's uh, it was a very fun juxtaposition of finally getting, sort of sitting i'm gonna sit down to read whoa okay now okay yeah. now a lot of things make more sense and other things make less sense yeah uh, oh, we've got so a question uh, from the audience. Uh, what is the best Dracula? Either the the best actor who has portrayed Dracula or best film at your discretion. Uh, the best, well, uh, best film is a different question from best Dracula film. Yes. Because the best film of Dracula, I think, pretty much has to be uh, uh, Murnau's Nosferatu. Mm, it's okay. just an 
altogether timeless masterpiece. It basically hand builds the horror genre. It's a tremendous triumph of mood, but as a Dracula movie, not so much, right? I mean, Orlock isn't Dracula. They made a lot of changes on purpose. They invent the myth of um, uh, the of the the Mina figure sacrificing herself uh, for Dracula instead of being a, a targeted attack. Um, so it's so it's a great movie, a masterpiece of a movie, but it's not a great. Dracula movie. Sure. Yeah. And I would say that of the movies of Dracula, none of them have quite really nailed what makes the novel special, but the best Dracula movie has got to be the 1958 Christopher Lee horror of Dracula or just Dracula as they called it in England. Um, in the, the first of the hammer Dracula's because Christopher Lee, first of all, is perfect for the role. Peter Cushing is perfect as Van Helsing. And although it, very radically departs from the plot of the novel. It very much maintains the sensibility of the novel, which is the Dracula is a feral, monstrous, foreign danger that will remake himself to become a threat to uh, bourgeois England, but can be stopped, right? The, the, the notion of a war against uh, between good and evil, between science and animalism, those are core themes of the novel, and those themes remain in the Hammer Dracula. The Hammer also doesn't go with any of this sympathy for the devil nonsense that the oh, later yeah. Draculas are um, uh, so prone to. Uh, <laughs> Dracula is just an evil, sadistic monster, and he's an evil, sadistic monster in all of the Dr Hammer Draculas. And that's part of what makes them great. And, of course, Christopher Lee, God bless him, would never have dreamed of playing Dracula any differently. So, I mean, when you combine sort of Lee's stage presence... Uh, the ability of um, uh, uh, God, who directed that was that that wasn't uh, Freddie Francis. Um, I'm going to be in so much trouble forgetting the name of the director, but uh, the director of um, uh, uh, of of that uh, of that film uh, to sort of capture that uh, that core ethos, and then Sangster's screenplay, yeah, it, that's sort of all over the map. But I mean, the whole the whole movie to core is is amazing. Uh, a, a follow -up. Fisher, that's the director. I'm oh, terrible. There we go. All right. Sorry. Uh, of, of follow up question, although it came beforehand. Uh, and speaking of sort of, you know, uh, liquid meals, which is the better liquid meal, Guinness or Bloody Mary? Bloody Mary. There we go. I Bloody Mary is, to agree. It's, it's got more nutrition. It, as you say, it has meat. Yep. You it, can put it, meat right in it. It does not just taste like liquid aspirin. So that's why I prefer also, it. also another thing. I didn't necessarily want to just go right after the poor Guinness people who God bless them. But no, I mean, <laughs> Bloody Mary is clearly superior on every metric. Uh, the last Dracula movie I watched for my own uh, horror uh, podcast, Miskatonic Musings, uh, was uh, Udo Kier's Blood of Dracula, <laughs> yeah. which I do not recommend. <laughs> if for no other reason, then Udo Kier is the whiniest Dracula, I think. I, and... I don't know. Like that certainly doesn't make him. It's it's not sympathetic. It's not sympathy for the devil. But it's just sort of simpering Dracula. I, I don't yeah. know. That doesn't that doesn't quite no. work. Um. Now you are also uh, so you've done sort of your your vampire work going through Dracula, watching so many Dracula films. Uh, uh, Night's Black Agent. That was a fascinating project. Sort of merging spies and vampires. And where did that come out of? Aside from just spy vampire spies are cool. Well. I mean, it, it, believe it or not, it came out because I was um, on my way home from running my game, and I used to run my game downtown at a friend's apartment, not quite downtown, but South Loop, and I was waiting for the train, and it was one of those sort of hot Chicago nights where there's this sort of dry wind blowing in off of Nebraska or wherever, and you're, um, uh, the hair's kind of standing up on the back of your neck, and the platform is dark. And you got the lights of the city, but it's sort of mysterious and creepy down there. And I was thinking just the words popped into my head. This is vampire weather. And I said, well, that'd make a good game. If you're playing vampire hunters, that'd be fun. Um, and I was just as the notion, what should I run next? And I was thinking, oh, I could do better than run that. I think I could maybe write that. <laughs> and uh, at the, as, as I'm thinking that, I'm thinking, so who hunts vampires in, in this game? If, if, if it's a modern day vampire hunting game because I'm in modern day Chicago thinking it. And I'm thinking, well, if, you know, vampires exist, Jason Bourne has to hunt them because he's the only person who can possibly kill a vampire. Right. And makes sense. That literally is, is all going through my mind in about 
three seconds on this train platform. And then I flash in that middle fight in the middle Bourne movie, which, which is what he, um, uh, the fight in that apartment in Munich where he's got the rolled up magazine and he basically escrim is the guy to death with it. <laughs> and I'm like, you put a stake in his hand. That's the fight scene. And I'm like, yeah, that, that, that whole idea just sort of crystallized in about 30 seconds. And then I came home and I forget if I um, proposed it to Simon and then wrote it up for my players or if I wrote it up for my players and then proposed it to Simon. But basically not too much later, I was running it as a, as my game for the alpha play test. And I was, you know, I had a agreement from Simon that if something came out of it, that he published it. So that's where it came from. And then the title it began, I think is the Nosferatu gambit. And then later on, um, it took forever to come up with the title. Actually, I had a bunch of really terrible titles. Oh, oh, and, can uh, we get, can we get uh, three of these terrible titles? Oh, well, I mean, Nosferatu Gambit's a pretty terrible title. I, mean, um, yes. uh, I think the other side of the mirror was one that was awful. Oh. And then um, what was the what was the third one? Stakes and Shadows it was something terrible like that. Yeah, yeah, and great. then and so I I was talking to uh, Jeff Tidball, I think, and I forget if it was he or me that actually hit it, but Jeff said something like. Well, you know, obviously you're garbage at coming up with titles. You just steal from somebody. Uh, pick a pick, and, and I think Jeff said something like, "I don't know, pick a Shakespeare quote." And I was like, "Oh, well, that makes sense." And it was like, "Well, I'll just steal the Shakespeare quote that Fritz Leiber used for the title of his anthology, <laughs> Nights Black Agents." And problem solved, right? <laughs> Excellent. I love it when a heist comes together. Exactly right. When Fritz Leiber or Gary Hanrahan has done all the work, that's the best time. <laughs> And now you're sort of moving on to continuing this vampire theme by uh, taking lead on Vampire the Masquerade 5th edition. Yeah, um, that was uh, uh, New White Wolf, uh, which is um, uh, part of Paradox Entertainment, I guess, or an imprint or whatever you call it. Um, they uh, took over the property from CCP in Iceland, and uh, they called me, or they actually they sort of talked to me briefly at Gen Con, and then they called me in September and they said, uh, hey, Ken, we'd like you to be lead designer on the new Vampire the Masquerade. And I said, well, that's very flattering, but you know I'm pretty much Team Van Helsing, right? <laughs> and they were like, and uh, and and Martin Erickson, who's the lead uh, uh, creative uh, the director at New White Wolf, said something on the order of, yes, you've already written the new Vampire, we just like you to write it again from the vampire perspective. And I was like, well, that's a pretty good pitch. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, one or two slips uh, between cup and lip, uh, as is inevitable when you write a, a core role playing game, but yeah, that's what we've done. And so I just saw the, um, the, the, uh, the PDF of the preprint, uh, the layout, and it's all very, very beautiful and gorgeous free league. The guys that did the layout for, um, uh, Tales from the Loop, they've done the layout for us. So it just looks amazing. Mary Lee did a bunch of really great photo, uh, realistic and photo art, tons of great imagery from all kinds of other places, plus some uh, created art. It, it looks amazing. So, you know, I'm just glad that the rules are playable. <laughs> that, that is always helpful. And I mean, you know, coming out of, you know, World of Darkness, you know, there's a lot of expectations that that, that property has gone through a lot of permutations. Was there pressure to sort of keep stuff from before or were you allowed to kind of create stuff whole cloth what what was uh, happening on that front well this was not ken height reinvents the world of darkness and i think a lot of people when i got the deal were either really excited or really worried that that's what it was and it wasn't i mean this is the the world of darkness the same world of darkness as always so i couldn't go in and say we're changing clans or we're doing this we're doing that um but one of the things that they'd already come up with, and I think one of the reasons they hired me, was they wanted to sort of go back to that 1991 feel where vampires were not sort of these glittering Illuminati running the world and you were sort of just accidental pawns in their game, but that being a vampire was both beautiful and terrible, but it was also dangerous and awful because you were sort of jammed up in your city, you're in this feudal, um, uh, claustrophobic almost a social situation. You have all kinds of other things going on besides just um, how can I manipulate the, you know, uh, Boston, you know, uh, globe into saying this about the, 
you know, New York Herald or whatever it is. That you thought <laughs> you were doing. I mean, there's a and lot of potential there. It, yes. It, it wasn't a lot of, I mean, there's still obviously, I mean, there's more social combat explicitly in this game than there ever has been because that sort of drawing room vampire is a huge part of live play, but they wanted the world to feel more dangerous. And certainly as, you know, um, uh, uh, Poe has shown us among other people, you can have that drawing room uh, style of, of action in a collapsing world. So the goal was to sort of bring back the, uh, the outside threats. And so the, the Sabbat is, is, is bad news again. Um, the, uh, the werewolves are still stalking out there being werewolves and the uh, human governments um, having been suddenly allowed to sort of look at everyone's bank records after nine 11 are like, man, some of these bank records are really old. <laughs> and there's some really weird stuff happening in them. Maybe they're terrorists. And so they sent some seal team sixes or whatever in and sure enough, it wasn't terrorists. So some parts of many human intelligence agencies have figured out vampires that get, exist and have formed the second inquisition in partnership with the Vatican to hunt down all the vampires and kill them. Nice. So that was the, uh, that, that was the sort of the draw that got me, you know, uh, pulled in was Ken, you can, you can kill all the vampires you want, except for these special vampires who you have to leave alive. And I'm like, great. All the vampires killing them. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> so, well, that was uh, yeah. Figure out what the second inquisition was up to and, 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 you know, it's sort of rolled. That was, that was sort of maybe the, the Ken Hydus part of the new setting. I, I mean, that was something I always found a little jarring about the uh, world of uh, world of darkness. Vampires is like, you are this sort of lone hunter in the night. Also, there's like 800,000 of you just all sort yeah, of just right. hanging out together and like having like battles over real estate. Mm -hmm. And then, and, it, and again, many people got great play out of that, but to me, that sort of, that sort of is orthogonal to the 1991 setting, the, the 1991 game that sort of blew everyone's mind and got everyone playing vampire. And, and so there, you know, you, you have to pull it back. You have to have fewer vampires. There has to be a more brutal competition. You have to be in danger as well as giving danger. Uh, lots of stuff that uh, maybe gets sort of, alighted in later editions is maybe a little more focused now although again we're not reinventing the wheel everything that came before is still true we're just representing it in the 21st century now something else to, that suddenly pops in my head i've known a lot of larpers i was in an entire stage play about larping uh you know so there's there's a 25 wow. year history of yeah. that mm -hmm. uh, uh and you know is this something, is, was that something you had to keep in the back of your mind? Not only, all right, how is this going to be played at the table, but like, how is this going to be played at like a rented hotel room or, a, you know, graveyard that's being right. trespassed? A, a rented graveyard, um, like you do. Well, the producer on the project, Jason Carl, is the guy who runs By Night Studios, who do, do the major LARP rules for Vampire Now. Uh, so we were always, you know, we always had that presence and that sort of reminder that this is a game that is not just for the table, that is at least a resource for the LARP rules. And in the game, there's lots of uh, very explicit callouts that say, hey, if you just want to freeform this, here's how. Um, you don't you don't have to necessarily roll all these dice or do all these things. Uh, you play vampire how you feel right playing vampire at the moment. And you can maybe only have one time when you ever roll dice and everything else is just uh, freeformed away. Uh, that is part of, you know, vampire play and always has been, and we just codified it for this. Um, we're, th this is not LARP rules. There are lovely LARP rules. Like I said, the Binite Studios has vampire LARP rules, and those will continue, I guess, to be the vampire LARP rules going forward. Um, although I don't know, because no one in their right mind would hire me to write LARP rules. Oh, and that's what would be my follow-up was, had you, right. have you ever written a game specifically for LARP? I'm writing a game, or I was writing a game, uh, for LARP, and I probably still am, unless Emily has fired me, uh, <laughs> with Emily Kerboss, uh, oh, okay. called uh, The Dare, which is a LARP in which you play uh, Mary Shelley, uh, or technically Mary Godwin, uh, Percy Shelley, Lord Byron, Claire Claremont, and John Polidori at the Villa de Dotti in 2016, or 2016, in 1816. Uh, the uh, legendary Haunted Summer, during which Frankenstein and the modern conception of the vampire are both invented. And the goal is you play those characters and then there is a event, probably a laudanum frenzy. And then <laughs> you play the characters that they have invented and see which of you becomes the all time Gothic standards and nice. which of you winds up forgotten on the floor. 
what what genre do you invent? <laughs> yes, exactly. And uh, Emily and I, Emily was telling me about a LARP she's done um, uh, uh, about uh, the life of John Milton, in which in the middle of the thing, you suddenly play uh, Adam and God and Satan, and John Milton becomes your GM. And <laughs> I was like, well, first of all, Emily, you're amazing. Um, <laughs> second of all, I want to steal that. Uh, I think that would be a great idea for a LARP in which, as I say, you play uh, Mary Godwin and Lord Byron and their hangers on um, at uh, that Villa de Udati. And she said, that'd be great. We should write that together. And when Emily Kerboss says we should write that together, the answer is yes, ma'am. And unfortunately, the answer was then, except that I've suddenly been hired to write Vampire of the Masquerade 5th Edition. So I have to uh, desert you for a, a time, uh, just like Percy Shelley deserted I, I his say, first wife. That's just research. Like, exactly. <laughs> Double so, bill those hours. Exactly. Uh, and so, um, uh, and so hopefully now that I'm done with that, I can get back to uh, doing my half of, of our game. And if Emily has forgiven me, which I'm sure she will, because she's a Tzaddik, she's a perfect human being. Um, maybe we'll be able to have something out during this uh, centennial year of Frankenstein. Excellent. Uh, we have a, a question uh, from the comments. Uh, Ken, you seem to like destroying vampires. Fair. Uh, do you have a favorite clan of kindred, or at least, uh, or uh, a least detested one? Well, I mean, here's the thing. I I enjoy the Tremere, but I think that's almost entirely because um, uh, Keith Herber wrote their clan book way back in the day. He was the he was he was the uh, line developer for Call of Cthulhu. Mm -hmm did uh, Return to Dunwich, did a lot of great Call of Cthulhu products. And then he wrote the clan book for the Tremere. And I remember reading it and thinking, man, this is not like any other clan book ever of vampires. But I, that said, I did blow up the Tremere Prime Chantry when I got a chance to. So I <laughs> guess they're not my favorite. And again, because of the sort of the visual perfection of Murnau, I think I've always enjoyed the Nosferatu best because they are hideous, horrible monsters and they can't fool themselves that they're not. And then they sort of make, you know, life hands them Nosferatu. They make Nosferatu aid. It's, it's, they're, <laughs> I, they're plucky. And I enjoy I've, that I, about I, them. I have always been a fan of Nosferatu. I think yeah. they, they are definitely, they, there's a lot of play. They can't do the like, now we're going to have a lot of sort of sexy brooding time. Like, right. <laughs> I mean, if they brood, they're just like sulking, you know, it's not the same thing at all. So I, I enjoy, I enjoy the Nosferatu just as, as a really great concept. And I think that, I mean, obviously, one of the genius things that Mark did with vampires, he took everyone's stereotype vampire and put them all in the same club so that you could play whatever kind of vampire you thought was the best, um, whether you wanted to be Lestat or you wanted to be Nosferatu or you wanted to be Dracula, everyone's in the club. But I think that he really stuck the landing on the Nosferatu uh, clan. So I enjoy them a great deal. Well, your mentioning of Call of Cthulhu helps me pivot uh, to my next segue, which is uh, that you uh, have not only have immersed yourself in uh, Dracula, but uh, you have also swam with Cthulhu a great deal in your design experience. And indeed, you've gone on record as calling Call of Cthulhu uh, one of, if not the best role-playing game. Is that not correct? The greatest role-playing game ever designed is Sandy Peterson's 1981 Call of Cthulhu Fight Me At Me Don't Care Still Right. All right. Uh, why? First of all, um, it seamlessly matches source material to play. Sandy invented the death spiral, which people don't remember, but he invented the death spiral by which as you engage in play, you begin to corrode your character's ability to engage in play. And that just keeps getting faster. And it's a brilliant mechanic for replicating the uh, character arc, by and large, of Lovecraft characters. And just that simple marriage of source material and gameplay is something that games written yesterday can't do. So all hats off to Sandy for that. Second of all, of course, it's based on the most gameable universe ever designed. And the secret to that is that the characters in all other universes are good and important and cool and you like them. So if you're playing in Star Trek and you're not Captain Kirk, you're, yeah, what's the point, right? Captain Kirk's the good one. He's cool. You're just Captain not Kirk, whatever. <laughs> uh, Conan the Barbarian is awesome. The Hyborian Age is just someone coloring over the Bronze Age, right? I mean, all of the, 
uh, settings that we know and love, the Lord of the Middle Earth, we know the Fellowship, we know Frodo and Gandalf and those guys. That's the characters that we've really bitten into and loved. Lovecraft's characters are literally ciphers. They just stand in for human rationality or Anglo-Saxon Protestantism or other abstractions that are then destroyed. So if you bring a human character that you've rolled up into the Lovecraft universe, you have something that Lovecraft did not bother to present. With one or two exceptions, obviously Charles Dexter Ward is a genuine human being because it's pretty much an autobiographical study of Lovecraft. But you'll note Ward is not the center of that novel. The center, to the extent it has one, is Dr. Willett, and Dr. Willett is a cipher. Um, we never know why he bothers to do all this stuff, except he was friends with Ward a while ago. That's not a motive. You'd be laughed out of screenwriting school for that. Um, so the uh, so the the universe is beautifully gameable, and obviously it, ex it extends all throughout space and time. It's uh, had absolute A-list writers uh, contributing to it. It's it's the best, most gameable universe ever. Uh, finally, it's uh, one of the, it's the only game at the time, and still one of the few games to be about moral adults making moral adult choices. All almost all other games are escapism of one kind or another, and that's great. I mean, who doesn't love escapism? I love escapism. You won't say I'm the anti-escapist guy, but they're either about you know um, uh, killing people and getting things, just straight up robbing for power. Also, <laughs> never going to criticize that. <laughs> or they're about, what if I had powers? What if I could fly around like Superman? What if I had a spaceship? You know, all those great questions. I want a spaceship. I want powers. I want to kill people and take their stuff. It's not like I'm against that. But to role play, I'm going to destroy myself so that people who don't know me can stay alive. That's an adult perspective. That's a moral perspective. And games are not usually about that. And Sandy wrote a game that was very, very explicitly about that in 1981 when, you know, we were still arguing about whether or not you should be allowed to roll and become a noble and traveler. <laughs> Die during character creation. Die during character creation. Not for a greater cause, just because you can't roll a seven. A uh, quick uh, tangent. Uh, Arthur Chenin wants to know, speaking of Chaosium, uh, have you seen the new RuneQuest Glorantha rules? And what do you think? I have not seen the new RuneQuest rules. They had them uh, there at Origins, but I think they were either just a alpha or something like that. Either way, I didn't I didn't pick them up. I'm sure they're great because the new Chaosium guys love Glorantha uh, uh, amazingly well. They 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 made that giant encyclopedia and everything else. Uh, the RuneQuest rules obviously are super solid and super excellent. I'm a big BRP fan, just in terms of clarity, mechanical uh, simplicity. Uh, I don't know if the new RuneQuest rules have gotten away from them in any given direction, because as I say, I haven't seen them, but I'm pretty sure that they wouldn't have gotten that far, because otherwise, why bother? You already have Hero Wars if you want to do a crazy, wonderful, adventure thing, uh, a, a new gamer thing with uh, Glorantha, and so now we have RuneQuest, which is the old school uh, D100 and Fire for Effect. I just want to know if you can still play a duck. That's really, that's that's where my heart I'm is. I'm morally at. certain you can still play a duck. Excellent. Wonderful. Uh, but back to uh, Call of Cthulhu. You know, Call of Cthulhu, of course, is responsible, in my opinion, for introducing so many people to Lovecraft. I mean, I yeah. played Call of Cthulhu and Delta Green before I'd ever opened, uh, you know, a Lovecraft, you know, novel or short story. Um, and I, I, I think that colors a lot of people's perspective, which is funny because you're talking about how it's this sort of big place full of sort of, you know, you know, moral decisions. But at the same time, it also like introduces people to the idea of like, well, here's Cthulhu's hit points. You know, here's how much strength the Shoggoth has. Like yeah. it's it's been responsible for codifying Lovecraft in a major way, which I think is debatable whether that's been good or negative for kind of how we approach Lovecraft and how we think about cosmic horror. Because, um, I mean, I guess, you know, the people... When they think about the mythos, they think of it as, as this detailed, structured, codified thing like, you know, Lord of the Rings. But you and you've read a lot of Lovecraft and a lot of stuff about Lovecraft. I don't think that's the case. I think Lovecraft was sort of playing a lot more and making it up as he went along a lot more than trying to sit down and establish, you know, sort of a universe. Right. Yeah. I mean, Lovecraft is presenting a universe, but he's more presenting a mythology about a universe. And Lovecraft, you can read his letters. He says... Mythologies contradict each other. Mythologies look at things from an entirely different perspectives, depending on which century and who's doing it. And that's what he did. I mean, he deliberately introduced contradictions into his own stories to provide just that 
parallax sense that you're seeing visions of something real that you still can't make out. Um, yeah, Chaosium and, and Call of Cthulhu definitely are are you know guilty of that codification that you talk about, where it's like, oh, the great old ones are like the Legion of Superheroes, and if you just have a long enough <laughs> Wikipedia page, then you can understand them. And obviously, you know that's them working in the same uh, vineyard that uh, Lynn Carter, God bless him, and August Derleth did. That they were trying to sort of set up the ground rules for a fictional universe, and not so much. <laughs> Uh, grappling with or looking at what Lovecraft was doing either as a mythographer, as a poet, or as a philosopher, which is fine. Uh, but it is uh, not antithetical, but at least orthogonal to what Lovecraft was doing, which was presenting this hoax mythology as a method of explicating um, uh, both his philosophy and his philosophy of horror in the sense of what makes the world scary is the lack of meaning in it. And the human attempt to draw meaning from a meaningless world is the pathetic joke that uh, Lovecraft was in on uh, and Lovecraft's aliens are in on and Lovecraft's characters are never in on. And that's sort of the <laughs> great irony at the heart of his writing, which is part of what makes it great literature instead of just a guy writing about people being eaten, which is fine, but it's not necessarily timeless. I mean, people being eaten. I mean, that's, there's a growth industry for that. Yeah, well, it's good stuff. But, um, but yeah, I mean, certainly, um, Chaosium did their part to, you know, boil everything down to how many toes on a Shoggoth or whatever else. I will point out that Sandy in his first draft did not give Cthulhu hit points that mm -hmm. Cthulhu had no hit points and they were added because people were like, we should give Cthulhu hit points. Um, the, the deities and demigods gave Cthulhu hit points and we're going to be behind the hit point curve. <laughs> we have a hit point gap. And also... I mean, you know, m much as it pains uh, the cosmicist school to admit it, someone hits L uh, Cthulhu with a boat and he goes away. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, people like you and me can say, well, the stars weren't right. You try that when the stars are right, you're going to be picking boat out of your hair. <laughs> but tr true fact, uh, boat v Cthulhu, boat, w boat one, Cthulhu zero. <laughs> Well, it knew it, it knew the special part. It's like Mike Tyson's punch out, you know, it needed to right. wait until he was glowing mm -hmm. to really uh, strike. Mike Tyson and Lovecraft, so many, so many similarities, so, so many, many parallels, commonalities. precisely. Right. Yeah. And, um, but now you say, you know, the 1981 is uh, sort of the gold standard, but you've now, uh, you know, continued and played off of that and uh, worked on this sort of the newest iteration of that, uh, which is Fall of Delta Green. Right. So what is Delta Green and why did it have to fall? Well, it had to fall because everything that mankind does and everything that the federal government does especially is doomed to failure. <laughs> um, <laughs> the uh, Delta Green was the federal government's uh, 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 special access program, codenamed, uh, uh, code word access black program uh, for combating the Cthulhu mythos. And it was established after the raid on Innsmouth in 1928 just as Lovecraft says, the federal government is aware of this problem, builds concentration camps to put all the deep ones in, uh, and then covers it all up because it would cause panic. And from those uh, direct, that direct hadith from the master, uh, John Tynes, uh, Dennis Detwiller, and Scott Glancy built out the mythology of Delta Green, which was, so what happened after that? And uh, in World War II, they fought occult Nazis. Um, in Vietnam, they fell apart because they overreached. Uh, they continued themselves as an illegal conspiracy in the 90s, battling Majestic, which was the group of the federal government that wanted to weaponize the mythos. And now after 9-11, they're back in the saddle again, and everything is great. Oh, hold on. No, it's not. Everything is much worse. <laughs> and that's the new Delta Green role-playing game that uh, 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 Scott and uh, Dennis uh, put together with uh, myself and Shane Ivey and uh, Greg Stoltze providing a lot of the other uh, heavy lifting source material, new rules um, to create a standalone role-playing game as opposed to making it a Call of Cthulhu setting because standalone role-playing games are where it's at, kids, especially if you don't want to sign a license agreement anymore. Um, so speaking of signing a license agreement, uh, we signed a license agreement with uh, <laughs> Jane and Scott and Dennis and John to do a gumshoe version of Delta Green that was set in the 1960s when it was still legal, even if it was still deniable, and 
had not yet destroyed itself in Vietnam. And the notion of writing to a apocalypse, writing to a catastrophe, writing to a destruction, that gave it sort of a thematic unity that I liked. I like the notion that you start off in these sort of, you know, crew cut, you know, tail end of Eisenhower, uh, optimistic uh, uh, Kennedy ask not era, and then it slowly turns into hell, just like the 1960s do for everybody <laughs> So, you know, we're going to, we're going to stop racism. We're going to go to the moon. We're going to cure cancer. We're going to end poverty and we're going to defeat communism and destroy the Cthulhu mythos. Those six things, I'm sure the government could easily do five of them <laughs> or one of them. <laughs> so we, uh, so, so looking at it through that same light as, you know, the, uh, the that parallel of overreach, uh, hubris and nemesis that, that happened uh, for real life, plenty of other places. But in our in the mythology happens to Delta Green, and it had to fall because they were human beings who touched the mythos and therefore lost perspective and were destroyed. Well, there we go. Yeah. So we've now looked at the sort of you know exploring gaming, and you've done a lot of gaming. Folks are sort of talking about uh, stuff in the uh, uh, chat. Uh, you've you know you've worked on Star Trek. You've worked in a lot of different genres. Um, but it's I, I'm interested to know. So we, we've looked at role playing fighting vampires and Draculas and role-playing sort of fighting the mythos and Cthulhu's. If you're going to sit down to do one of those things, like what's, what's the main difference? Like what does each provide, you know, what's the strength of, of going after the mythos versus going after vampires? You know, when you're as a player or a GM, you know, what, what are the strengths and weaknesses of both? I mean, I think the part of the, I mean, in, in my approach, the, thing about the mythos is that uh to play in the cthulhu mythos you are playing like i say a tragedy of self-sacrifice you are destroying yourself so that other people can live um that is not necessarily the case in vampire novels obviously in dracula if you read the novel on the surface uh poor quincy dies heroically but everyone else lives and even there's a new kid and his name is quincy so in a way quincy lives on too <laughs> And Dracula's dead, and the scar is off Mina's forehead, and good is triumphed, and bad is defeated. And that's the difference, right? I mean, are you looking for a story in which um, heroism is ju is justified and heroism um, uh, produces results, and you genuinely see that you've made the world safer? Uh, then that's vampires. And if you are looking for a world in which you grapple with the philosophical inability of humankind to make a difference, that's Cthulhu. And the, yeah, like you suggest, the adrenaline of armoring up and going at them is roughly the same. And maybe on one, you've got, you know, Hawthorne stakes and on the other one, you've got powder of Ibn Ghazi, but it's basically the same sort of act activity. Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's sort of the, what content do you want? What sort of philosophical content or emotional arc do you want the game to hit? And certainly you can play games of vampire hunting where you're just as ground down and immiserated by it as you would be if you spent your whole life as a farmer or a vice cop or anything else, right? You know, <laughs> anything you do for other people that involves hard work has a cost, right? And certainly anything you do, you know, if you're a, a, in, in the Marine Corps, if you're in, you know, an ambulance service, yeah, that's going to have a toll on you that in Call of Cthulhu you might mark as sanity loss or in Del Fall of Delta Green you might mark as losing bonds um, uh, with other people. But uh, the specific philosophical grounding of your combat is a different one because obviously firemen don't say, well, we've defeated fire forever. <laughs> <laughs> but it's we did not, it, guys. Like, but it's not a nihilist struggle the way that it is against the Cthulhu mythos. The, the world is not inherently fire. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yet. yeah. I mean, Give it time, time, Ken. Yeah, sure, California. But I mean, most of the world. <laughs> <laughs> no one's uh, dropped a nuke on the Midgard serpent yet. That we know of. I mean, mm. uh, in, in fairness, they did that. Um, uh, I did that. Or technically, I, I, I had Truman do that. I, I'm, I'm well aware. <laughs> right. Um, uh, and, uh, that turned out about as well as you'd expect. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got this wonderful history, uh, wonderful stuff sort of coming out. Um, a lot of the folks who, who watch this are, uh, writers are folks, uh, who are interested in, in playing in that sort of Lovecraftian, uh, mythos and world, uh, as a writer and as a game designer, kind of what, uh, 
what would you suggest? Like what, what are what are pitfalls and what are sort of areas uh, that people may uh, not think to explore? Because there's been sort of, a, you know, one glorious thing about Lovecraft was that he was very generous and he sort of opened up his toy box for people to rummage around and play in. Um, but it means that there's been a lot of Lovecraft and, you know, sort of, I, I joke that Cthulhu has become in some ways the sort of McDonald's arch of uh, the horror world. Um, so for folks wanting to still play with that, those toys, but not either, you know, just do the same old schlock, uh, what, uh, what recommendations do you, do you have? Well, I mean, first of all, let's not, you know, be too hasty to dismiss the same old schlock. Plenty of that is good stuff still. Um, I'm, I'm fond of saying certainly in a gaming context that a cliche is only a cliche from the outside. When you're inside it, that's adventure, right? <laughs> um, but if you're a writer and you want to create something, I mean, the way that you know that all of that is the same old in theory is that you have some Im image in your head of what would not be the same old and take that image and play to that. And that might be a thing that you know more than anybody else or that you know better or that you haven't seen other people blend with the Cthulhu mythos or haven't done it effectively. Um, and so you may say, well, gosh, I know an awful lot about um, uh, uh, the, the women's movement in Central America. I wonder if the patriarchy in Central America could be a mythos uh, construction or if it could be valuably symbolized by the mythos. And, you know, I know nothing about the women's movement in Central America, but I'll bet that the patriarchy did all, all kinds of awful things. So it's, just fair, it's a fair bet. Find out which of them were, you know, um, uh, involved in some sort of questionable activities, and you start adding a mythos connotation to that. And maybe somebody's got deep one connections, and they got to keep the women subject so they can be bred with deep ones, or they've got to do whatever. Um, they got to control their dreams because it it's important to keep the dreamland sterile. You know, I don't know what it would be, but it would be something that you are driving because of your concern and your knowledge, and that by definition makes it your uh, area, your your. Uh, your original concept because it came out of you, came out of what you're thinking. Um, another possibility might be that you go and you explore the mythos and you say, well, what hasn't everyone gone after? I mean, people go bananas for the deep ones. They go bananas for the ghouls. They go bananas for the Migo. But I don't know that the um, spectral polyps, the right, the flying polyps, the guys underneath the, uh, the, the tunnels in Australia that uh, frightened the great race of Yith so badly they had to flee uh, 70 billion years into the future or 70 million years in the future, that that seems like those are pretty badass guys, but no one ever talks about them. They're not a lot of uh, flying polyp fiction. Uh, it, Lovecraft, of course, refers to them as the elder things, just to confuse matters, but... Um, <laughs> What's that mythos thing? Again, you tell the same tale right, yeah. in a slightly different key. But those, um, uh, but, but those critters seem like they might have some potential. And so you're like, well, I have a really good idea for those guys. Maybe they are actually, because they're invisible and they make a whistling noise, maybe radio waves are sort of the way that we perceive them. And now you can do a radio flying polyp story and maybe they actually live in the Van Allen belt and have only been coming down onto earth. And whenever um, the uh, uh, great race found them, they would put like a grounding station. It's not that they're imprisoned under the earth. It's that there's a big piece of metal that grounds them forcibly under the earth. And that prevents them from just flying around and causing problems for everybody. And you're <laughs> like, well, there, no one has done that. No one has combined uh, radio, uh, hobbyism, uh, the spectral polyps, um, and Australia, I'm going to do that, or I'm going <laughs> to, or I'm going to leave Australia completely out of it. I'm going to set it some other place that I happen to know really well, because I live there, because I went to school there, because I think Finland is awesome. And a country that's all cell phones and Aurora Borealis has probably got some relevance in this discussion. There we go. Right. Uh, I, I'm very partial to Zoogs. So, you know, I, I think are terrific. Zoogs I think, are great. I think, you know, and nice Zoog -based I think Zoogs canonically can sort of go between worlds. They just don't make a big deal out of it like the ghouls do. Because <laughs> you, can, you can walk your way into the Enchanted Wood. I'm pretty sure that they did that once. So I think the Zoogs might be amongst us even mm -hmm. now. Indeed. Uh, we got a question from the crowd of, about RPG design in general. Do you think that default solutions to puzzles should be solved through PC abilities instead of solely relying upon player intellect? Well, I mean, having uh, designed three games now that use the gumshoe system, I certainly have no problem with uh, PC ability being the default. And certainly if solving the puzzle is needed for the story to progress, it had better be, because otherwise... You might be at a table with players, not even dumb players, but players who, I don't know, went to work that day and their brain isn't <laughs> working on all 
uh, also learners, or they were at Origins all weekend and are goofed <laughs> up. Uh, who can say what might have happened to those players? And you can spend, you can wind up thinking we'll play uh, our game for uh, four hours, but instead we're going to solve a puzzle for four hours, and that's not fun. That's not even fun in an escape room, much less you know here and now. Yeah, I once had to in a D and D game be part of a, a puzzle that had to be solved via very specific spells from about four different uh, books, player books and like add-ons, some of which we did not know we had access to. Mm -hmm. That was a long night. <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing, right? I mean, I, I'm i sure that someone somewhere has enjoyed that, but I don't think most people enjoy that. And by and large, there is a there is a charm there is a, a a charge to be gotten from being smart enough in the real world to have solved a puzzle a fictional puzzle whether it be a mystery you're reading or a game you're playing but the difference is when you're reading a mystery other stuff is going on when you're playing a game you can't be like well we haven't figured out how to get out of this room yet but let's go off and fight a bunch of kobolds until we do <laughs> <laughs> that, that doesn't happen you're you really are all or nothing and it's that all or nothing that makes me think well the puzzle is really got to be kind of easy in which case how satisfying can it be really and i was like oh look at that uh red green blue no one ever thought of that um <laughs> so you know uh, it's fun to give players handouts certainly and have them notice things in them i mean that's part of what the Dracula dossier does with providing you the entire Dracula unredacted to pick stuff out of, but you'll note that we did provide footnotes so that if you didn't feel like doing that, you could find them and get right to the game. I, uh, I, I'm, I'm very reminded and spoilers for the good place, but I, I love, uh, in the good place, oh, uh, good place. when, uh, when they're like, we figured out, we found your four clues. Well, I left 1400 clues for you, but good job. Exactly. Good job. Well done. Uh, so I have a, so my final question for the evening is a very personal one, one that uh, sort of touches at me uh, very uh, deeply because uh, I get asked it a lot as H.P. Uh, Lovecraft for my show. Uh, are you familiar with the Old Man Henderson legend? The Old Man Henderson legend. I don't believe so. All right. Uh, the legend, and it's it, people claim it's true, and I'm suspicious of it. Uh, but the idea is there was a Call of Cthulhu game by nominal friends where the the GM, the storyteller, was so awful, so railroady, you know, killing players, you know, in a very arbitrary, unfair manner that one player decided to take it upon himself to punish the GM, and so they crafted this character, Old Man Henderson. <laughs> And they put together a, you know, a 50 page backstory, which, you know, he could pull out any skill, any ability from because it was written in his backstory and proceeded to spend the rest of this campaign derailing the game, uh, being <coughs> sort of like half crazed hobo with a shotgun uh, and just, you know, doing everything he could to to make sure his GM did not have a good time as a just punishment for being a railroaded GM. And it's it's upheld as this great story of of justice, and oh, a player finally you know showed those GMs. And I view it as like the worst story of someone who just showed up to ruin a night of playing games. <laughs> I mean, if it, let let us arguendo assume that their keeper was in fact terrible. Sure. Um, it sounds like uh, what Oscar Wilde said about Mister and Missus Henry James was that it's a good thing they found each other as opposed to making four people miserable. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, uh, yay, I guess that, you know, they are locked in eternal idiot Valhalla forever. But <laughs> let's hope so. Let's hope so. I mean, it, it, to, to my mind, to my way of thinking, and I get this question panel after panel, after panel, after panel, slowly people have learned at least not to ask me, but the question is always some form of my player in X game does X idiotic, ridiculously bad, dumb thing. How do I get him to stop? And the answer is stop playing with that guy. He's terrible at it. Um, or like in the same way that someone, you know, you know, like that, be that, an adult. <laughs> yes. But in the same way that if someone, if I went to movie panels at film festivals and everyone would raise their hand and say, my friend, Carl is always talking in the theater. How do I get him to stop? It's like, don't invite him to the movies with you. He's <laughs> terrible at it. Invite him to bowling where it doesn't matter if he's talking. Or as you suggest, if you're of a kindly, generous nature, say, hey, Carl, maybe keep your yap shut during the movies. Everyone else would like to watch it. Or you say to Carl, hey, Carl, 
maybe don't be a bozo during game. That would be nice. Or perhaps even, hey, Carl, what are you trying to get out of the game? And how can we help you do that without annoying me and Doug and Sandra and other people who might want something slightly different than what you seem to want, which is to derail everything. <laughs> <laughs> which is to cause maximum carnage and I mean, watch the world. My burn. notion is life is too short and you have so little time in the world. Don't spend it doing fun things with unfun people. Let them go off and find their own solo hobby involving, you know, radio repair or whatever. Don't. <laughs> oh, see, now that's how you find the polyps, though. Right, it is. And and then they're welcome to Carl. <laughs> well, Ken, thank you so much. Uh, we've talked about some of your projects that are coming out, but what should folks sort of be on the lookout for and where should they go to follow your luminous career? I mean, right now, the things that are uh, coming out that are right now blossoming, uh, Shoggoth like are Fall of Delta Green, as you said, and Vampire the Masquerade, fifth edition. Uh, Fall of Delta Green is out now. Vampire will be at Gen Con. Uh, coming from me soon will be the second volume of my Tour to Lovecraft series, Tour to Lovecraft The Destinations, uh, going along with Tour to Lovecraft The Tales. We kickstarted that last year, and I should probably finish writing them so that we can release it. Wow. Uh, I've also got uh, the annotations to the new King in Yellow edition from uh, Arc Dream that I am doing now as we speak, and that will be out whenever that's out. But people should rush over to the Arc Dream site and, um, uh, Sign up for the pre-order of that book because Samurai is doing the art, so it's going to be gorgeous. Fantastic. And of course, if folks are already not listening to Ken and Robin talk about stuff, uh, they should be listening to Ken and Robin talk about stuff. It right. is and, fantastic. And I'm at Kenneth Height on Twitter, and I'm Kenneth Height right here on the Facing Book. Wonderful. Uh, if folks are interested in following uh, what goes down in my world, you can watch, watch me impersonating HP Lovecraft uh, over at asklovecraft.com. I'm about to go on my summer hiatus, and we have a very special hiatus uh, sort of filler material, which I think people will uh, hopefully enjoy if I can make the audio not terrible. Uh, otherwise, uh, if folks are interested in these, this interview series, Ask Lovecraft After Dark, uh, you can catch it uh, every other week. And uh, if you'd like to be part of the conversation, uh, join live as we have these uh, talks, uh, go to Facebook and join the Ask Lovecraft Appreciation Society, a, a delightful coterie of uh, attractive and talented people. Otherwise, yep, you can follow me on Twitter as well, at Lehman Kessler. You can follow Ask Lovecraft on Twitter, at Ask Lovecraft. And thank you all so much. Thank you to the folks uh, watching live uh, who were providing some delightful chats, giving gaming uh, uh, sort of anecdotes as we were continuing <coughs> along, uh, debating the Castlevania Netflix show, which uh, I started and uh, have been enjoying. And uh, yeah, that's going to do it for us, Ken. Thank you so much. And I hope you uh, recover well from the con experience. Oh, thanks so much, Lehman, and I will endeavor to do that. Or I'll just uh, turn up the refrigeration in my house to 55 degrees and stay young forever. Yay! Watch out for spinal fluid. Watch out!